Hi folks, welcome to the Math 611B Chapter 2 Concept Roundup on Limits and Continuity. This isn't an exhaustive look at Chapter 2, but it is an overview of the major concepts. If you check the video description down below, you can find a downloadable copy of the notes, as well as a link to a Chapter 2 review, and even a link to a video of the solutions to that Chapter 2 review. Each of the 10 topics listed are timestamped below as well, so if you're interested in, say, discontinuities, then you can just look at where that begins and skip right to there. In terms of corresponding to your textbook, these first three deal with section 2.1, the next two are 2.2, 2.3 for the next two, and the last three would be section 2.4. Okay, let's dive in to a graphical interpretation of limits. So graphically, a limit is the y value that a graph approaches as x closes in on a certain value. It doesn't actually matter whether it gets to that y value, so you could still have, say, a hole or something happening at that, uh, at that point. The expression, the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x, reads the limit of f of x as x goes to 1 or approaches 1. So if I had some graph that looked like this, and I wanted to find the limit as x goes to 1 on that function, well, I'd just take a look at the graph and say, as x goes to 1, what y value do I seem to be coming towards from both sides? Seems to be a y value of 2. And that's not surprising on that graph. It actually does have a y value of 2 uh, when x is 1. But even if the function didn't exist at x is 1, the limit can. So if I had some function that looked like, let's say like this, had a hole right there, we would still say in this function, the lim as x goes to 1 of f of x is going to be that y value that we're approaching. We seem to be approaching a 2 from the left and from the right we must have a limit of 2, even though the graph doesn't exist at that point. To figure out what we mean by uh, left and right sides, we need a couple of other little definitions here. So I'm not sure how well this shows up. This should say, lim as x goes to 1, and there's a superscript of a negative. That means the limit as we approach 1 from the left. If instead we had a 1 with a plus, it means approaching 1 from the right. And in order for the limit to exist, those two things must be equal. The limit from the left, this has a negative there, must be equal to the limit from the right. So let's figure that out with an example. Let's say that we had this piecewise function. On that function, we would say the limit as we approach 1 from the left is going to be, well, I would trace this with my finger, but I'll do it with the pen since I'm right here. The limit from the left seems to be a y value of 1. Now, as we approach 1 from the right, let's see what that gives us. So I'm approaching an x value of 1 from the right, I'm going towards a y value of 2 in this case. Doesn't matter whether I actually get there or not. The limit is about what we're approaching or tending towards. So the question then becomes, does the limit as x goes to 1 exist? In order for that to exist, these two things, the left and right, have to be equal. So in this case, it does not exist. And that is because the left-hand limit left-hand limit was not equal to the right-hand limit. And if you were doing this with your fingers on the page, and you trace toward 1 with your left and right fingers, uh, your fingers would have to meet in order for the limit as x goes to 1 to exist. All right, in terms of algebraic interpretation of limits, we don't always want to have the graph uh, or have to produce the graph, because sometimes the graph is, is unpleasant to make. 
In many cases, f at a and the limit are going to be the same. So let's say we had this example here, lim as x goes to 2 of x squared. I can come up with the graph of that function. We've graphed a parabola a bajillion times. We know that it contains the point 2, 4. And we're pretty confident that as you go towards 2 from the left and from the right, you're going towards a y value of 4. In terms of algebraic approaches, what we would do is we would just substitute in. The lim as x goes to 2 is just going to be the same as putting in a 2 for x. So we get 2 squared or 4, okay, which saves us from having to produce the graph at all. Whenever we can, this is the approach we want to take to limits. So in essence, the limit doesn't really do anything in this case. It's the same as the function value. We can just sub in. But there are cases where substitution will fail. So if substitution causes an illegal operation, like division by 0, the even root of a negative, log of a non-positive, there are a couple of possibilities. Basically, we can either find the limit through algebraic manipulation, or there may be no limit. We can manipulate algebraically using the following techniques. So we could factor, we could multiply by conjugates, we could deal with nested fractions, that's fractions within fractions, we might have to combine several fractions, which would mean finding a lowest common denominator. Or we use this fact right here. And there's a great proof of this that you can find in all sorts of places, um, but there's a, there's a good walkthrough at the Khan Academy. You can also just take a look at the graph of sine x over x, and you'll see that as x goes to 0, y does look like it's going to 1. But you know it's not actually the case there. There's got to be a hole there, because you can't put 0 into sine x over x. One thing that's worth noting as a byproduct of this is that sine 5x over 5x, that would also be 1. As long as you've got the same thing on top and bottom as x goes to 0, you'll always have a, a result of 1. Let's try some of these out. So we said the first tack that we'd take is to try and uh, substitute in. So let me put in the number 2 here. I'll have 2 squared plus 3 times 2 minus 10. That's looking good on top. That's going to be 0. On the bottom, I'd have 2 minus 2, which would be 0. I'd have 0 over 0. You can't divide by 0. You can't even divide 0 by 0. This is an illegal operation. So we're going to need some limit magic to get around it. And the most basic of our techniques is going to be factoring. So if you see something that can be factored, there's a good chance you should factor it. x plus 5, x minus 2 on top, x minus 2 on the bottom. If x actually had a value of 2, this would be undefined. But the limit is just saying that x is getting really, really close to 2. So if I divide these out, I'm not dividing by 0. I'm dividing by really, really close to 0. So we get around this by dividing out the x minus 2 over x minus 2. And we have the limb as x goes to 2 of x plus 5. OK, now we ask, can we sub? Absolutely. So we will sub x equals 2. And once you substitute, that's when you get rid of the limit notation. We'll have 2 plus 5 or 7. If you were to graph that initial function, here's what you'd find. You'd find, this is a 5 here, you'd find that you get a line, but it would have a hole in it at the point 2, 7. So the limit as we approach 2 really would be 7, but you can't substitute a 2 into it. It's got a hole there. Let's try some other ones. In this case, again, we'll try and substitute in a 4. So I'd have 4 minus 4 all over root 4 minus 2. Again, that's 0 over 0. That's not helpful at all. When we see a radical and either a plus or minus term next to it, that's when we're going to want to use multiplying by conjugates. And the conjugate of root x minus 2 is just this, root x plus 2. But I can't just multiply the bottom by root x plus 2. I have to multiply the top as well. 
really, root x plus 2 over root x plus 2, that's the number 1. That's the only number we can multiply by with impunity. It doesn't change the value of anything, just the look. OK, let's see what we get. That's going to give us lim as x goes to 4 over x minus 4 all over root x plus 2. That does not look any better. OK, let's see what happens on the bottom. We would have root x times root x, which is x. The property of conjugates is that the middle terms, as you multiply, they're not going to, uh, they're going to add to 0, rather. So you'll have plus 2 root x, minus 2 root x, those are gone. You'll have this minus 4. And we can see right here, we've got something we can divide out. What will that leave us with? Just root x plus 2. And at this point, we ask ourselves, OK, now if I put in that 4, does it cause any illegal operations, like especially like division by 0? No, it's fine. So we're going to sub x equals 4. And when we do that substitution, again, that's when we drop the limits. We're evaluating at that point. And we get 4 in the end. And if you were to go and graph this function, you'd see that as x goes to 4, y would also go to 4. OK, the next one. We've got fractions within fractions. Hopefully, you can see this. There are a bunch of ways you can deal with these nested fractions. This is my favorite way, is to just notice that the small fractions have a common denominator of 2 by 2 plus h. So we can multiply the whole big fraction by 2 plus 2 plus h. 2 by 2 plus h, rather, over 2 by 2 plus h. Now, let's multiply through. If I take this first fraction and multiply it by 2 by 2 plus h, the 2 plus h's are going to divide out. And all you'll be left with is 3 by 2. If I do the same thing with the 3 over 2 by 2 plus, 2 by 2 plus h, the 2's will divide out. So I'll have minus 3 by 2 plus h. And on the bottom, I'll have h by 2 by 2 plus h, which we could expand out, but is not going to be helpful to us. OK, let's just follow along now. Algebraically, we have 6 minus 6 minus 3h on top. On the bottom, we have h by 2 by 2 plus h. Or on the top, negative 3h by h by 2 by 2 plus h. Aha! The h's can divide out. And that may get us around our problem of division by 0. Because if we had tried in the first place, obviously, you can't have a 0 on the bottom of that whole big fraction. OK. So I have negative 3 over 2 by 2 plus h. And here, can we substitute 0 for h? Absolutely. So we go sub h equals 0. Once I substitute, I drop the limit notation. And we get a final answer of negative 3 quarters. I've got two fractions in this next one. Again, I try and substitute the 1. I'd get 1 over 0. That's no good. So instead, what we want to do is try and find some way to deal with this. And that might be by combining fractions. To add or subtract fractions, we need to think of the LCD. So x squared minus 1 is really x plus 1 by x minus 1. That's what's in the bottom of that first fraction. Meaning that the LCD here would be simply x plus 1 by x minus 1. And it also means that this first term is just missing that x plus 1. So I can multiply it by x plus 1 over x plus 1. Let's see what that gives us. The limit as x goes to 1 of x plus 1 all over x minus 1, x plus 1 and then minus that 2 
over x plus 1, x minus 1. Since the denominators are the same, I just go x plus 1 minus 2. That's an x minus 1 on top. All over x minus 1, x plus 1. Ooh, we get to divide something out here. Pretty exciting, which would leave us with a 1 on top. So we follow it through. That gives us 1 over x plus 1. We've done some fancy stuff. Now we ask ourselves, can I substitute a 1 for x? And yes, we can. Once again, we're subbing in, so we drop the limit notation. That gives us 1 over 1 plus 1, or 1 half as a final answer. Here's one of these ones that's probably going to use this sine x over x equals 1. So lim as x goes to 0 of this. Again, try and sub in 0. You get sine of 0, which is fine. That's 0 divided by 0. <laughs> That's no good. So we can't sub in. And here's what we think to ourselves. I want a 3x on bottom. So build it. If you want a 3x on bottom, that's easy. We just multiply the bottom by 3. But if we multiply the bottom by 3, we multiply the top by 3 as well. This is going to give us the limit as x goes to 0 of 3 sine 3x all over 3x. Or, if you want to get fancy, it's 3 times sine 3x over 3x. Okay, and that's an optional step. But it hammers home the idea that this becomes the number 1. And as x goes to 0, 3 just becomes 3. Every constant stays the same. The 3 does not care about the x at all. So 3 becomes 3. So we have 3 times 1. And we haven't subbed in 0, but we've used this property of the limit. So the limit notation is gone here. And we just have 3 as our answer. And if we were to look at the graph of sine 3x over x, you would see around x equals 0, you'd expect to find a y value of 3, even though it's a whole. OK, one last uh, algebraic limit. We want to find the limit as x goes to negative 2 of root x minus 5. So let's see what we can do here. I could try to sub. I'd have the square root of negative 2 minus 5, or the square root of negative 7 which is nothing in the real number system. It looks like there's not much we can do here. There's no multiplying by, by conjugates. There's no division. So we can't sub. Can't do anything, really. It's at this point that we should start to think of the graph. So let's think, what does this look like? This is a square root graph that's been moved five units to the right. And we know about those basic shapes, and we know about how they're translated left, right, up, and down. And we're looking for the limit back around here at negative 2. Well, that graph does not exist in the neighborhood of negative 2. This function doesn't exist. in the neighborhood of x equals negative 2. Okay, And that's not just that it doesn't exist at negative 2. It exists nowhere around negative 2. And when that's the case, we can say this. The limit does not exist. If you tried to trace it with your finger, you couldn't. That will often be the case when there's no algebraic manipulation that you can do. But you do need to consider the graph uh, to make sure. 
Okay, the next thing we looked at is the squeeze or sandwich theorem. And it's basically looking at cases like this. I'll try and color code this. So let's suppose I have some kind of on top graph. I'm going to call it h of x. I have some in the middle graph. I'm going to call it g of x. And I've got some on the bottom graph here. I'm going to call it f of x. And it says, if f's on the bottom, and g's in the middle, and h's on the top, though they could be at the same place because those equal signs, then the limits must happen in that order as well. And that doesn't look like it's particularly useful, but it does allow us to find some difficult limits, especially involving sine and cosine of undefined angles, um, and particularly when they have variables as coefficients. So if we wanted to find uh, the limit of x squared, times sine of 1 over x as x goes to 0. Our usual tack would be we try and substitute 0 in. So that would be 0 times the sine of 1 over 0. Whoa, there's a 1 over 0 in there. Can't have that. That's undefined. So instead, here's what we can say. We can say that I'm sure that sine always lies between negative 1 and 1, inclusive. And then from there, I could multiply the whole inequality by x squared. So I'd have negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared sine 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared. That middle limit is still really difficult for us to evaluate. But the end ones are really easy. This, we can figure out the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared. You can just sub in. That would be negative 0 squared or 0. This, can we figure out the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared? Again, we can substitute in here. 0 squared is 0. And since they follow this inequality, it must be that the limb as x goes to 0 of x squared sine 1 over x, if it's sandwiched in between a 0 and a 0, must also be 0. That gets us to the end of our 2.1 material. In 2.2, we start talking about limits involving infinity. And in order to do that, it might be helpful to think about a few basic graphs. y equals 1 over x looks like this. Uh, y equals ln x looks like this. And y equals e to the x, or really any positive base greater than 1, is going to look like this. But e is going to be our favorite base in calculus to use for exponentials. Uh, and we'll see why in a little bit. OK, so some of the important limits. In that green, first green graph, as x goes out toward either positive infinity or negative infinity, we are approaching a y value of 0. As x goes toward 0 from the left, let's check that out. 0 from the left, we're going down towards negative infinity. As we approach 0 from the right on 1 over x, we get infinity. And that is a good explanation of why division by 0 is undefined. As you approach division by 0 from the left, you get negative infinity. As you approach it from the right, you get positive infinity. They don't converge on a value. There is no limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x. For ln x, if we approach 0 from the right, we get negative infinity. And we should note that if we go to an x value of infinity on ln x. This goes up. It goes up slower and slower, but it keeps going up. It is not asymptotic. It's not bounded on top. So we get infinity. Lim as x goes to negative infinity on e to the x. Uh, let's just follow this one. To the left, we're going towards a 0. And lim of e to the x as x goes to positive infinity. Well, that's going to be infinity. 
and it gets quite steep. When we want to deal with limits involving uh, infinity in rational functions, there's a cute little trick that works out. So remember, our first uh, idea here is that we try to substitute in. So this is going to be 2 times infinity squared minus 3 times infinity over 5 times infinity squared plus 2. Oh my gosh, that makes my brain hurt. I have no idea what that means. And anyways, you can't really substitute in infinity. But 0 and infinity are sort of reciprocals of each other. Um, so what we can do is we can take the highest power that appears on the bottom, and we're going to multiply the whole fraction by 1 over that power, both on top and bottom. And that doesn't look like it's going to do anything useful for us right away, but it does. It gives us this. Lim as x goes to infinity of, that's going to be a 2, minus 3 over x up top. On the bottom, we'd have 5 plus 2 over x squared. Now, we're going to evaluate. As x goes to infinity, this 2 becomes a 2. 3 over x, well, 3 over infinity is going to be incredibly small, or 0. The number 5, as x goes to infinity, that's just going to be the number 5. And finally, 2 over x squared, as x goes to infinity, again, that's going to be 2 over a huge number, or essentially 0. So by doing that little trick at the start, multiplying by 1 over the highest degree of the bottom, we end up with a value of 2 fifths. And if you were to graph this function, you would see that as you go far to the right or far to the left, you're approaching a y value of 2 fifths. And there's the formal justification right here. You want to make sure it's highest power of the bottom that you use because you don't want to have undefined on the bottom. OK, now most expressions have a specific term that drives their growth as x gets large, either to the left or the right. So as we approach infinity or negative infinity, those are really the only terms worth considering. And that means that we can apply a shortcut for limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity in a rational function. Right here, the term that drives the growth up top, 2x squared minus 3x, the term that's in charge as x gets large is the 2x squared. If you went out towards a minute million, 2 times a million squared, well, that's a very, very big number. That's a trillion minus 3 times a million. Trillions are way bigger than a million. The 2x squared is driving it. Or even more dramatically on the bottom, if you went out towards a million, this would be 5 trillion, and this would be the number 2. If you had $5 trillion, you probably wouldn't care too much about $2. So the driver terms on top and bottom are 2x squared and 5x squared. This is going to give us the same result that we found on the last page of 2 fifths. It's a little less formal, but it's a little faster, too. If the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity is a constant, then we found a horizontal asymptote. So that means this function here has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 2 fifths. Okay, let's try the, other, the next one. Driver term on top is 4x. Driver term on bottom is 7x squared. Let's figure out what's going on here. In this case, we have the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 4x over 7x squared. Okay, so this would divide out. We have 4 over 7x. And as we go to negative infinity, that 4 stays a 4, but the bottom gets huge. Now, it gets negative huge, but that doesn't really make a difference. 4 over uh, a billion, or 4 over negative a billion, is still closing in on the number 0. So similarly, since we found a constant, this function has a horizontal asymptote of 
y equals 0. And from the last course, from 6 to 1b, we already knew that. We know that when the higher power is on bottom, you're going to have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. But this justifies it from sort of a calculus lens. OK, n behavior models. These are simple functions that model the far left or right behavior of a more complicated function. So you might have a function that is difficult to graph, and you want to figure out what it looks like uh, to the far left or far right. Not just that it goes to infinity or goes to 0, but in terms of when it goes to infinity, how it goes there. Does it go there parabolically, exponentially, linearly? We want to know. To find the end model, here's what we're going to do. We're either going to divide the driver terms of top and bottom, or we're going to have to use inspection to look at the most important term to the far left or right. If we're not sure, we can just substitute in large x values. And those can be either large positive or large negative. Often, even 10 will give you an idea of what is the most important term. So right over here, if I wanted to graph this function, it's going to be a bit of a mess. I know it's got a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. It's got some other weird stuff happening. It's going to have an x-intercept at negative 1. But there's a simple function that's going to tell me about its far left and far right behavior. And it comes from taking the driver term on top and dividing it by the driver term on bottom. And this is the end model. So if I were to go and graph that function, um, they might not look that much uh, the same, the y equals x cubed plus 1 over x minus 2 and the y equals x squared. They might not look that much the same in the middle. That's not surprising. It's an n model. But in the end, to the far left and far right, they should look pretty similar. Let's check it out. OK, the red one looks kind of like the purple one, different in the middle. But if I zoom out really far, you'll see that the red one becomes an excellent model of the purple one. They look almost identical. And which one is easier for us to graph? Obviously, the y equals x squared is easier for us to graph. So there's the end model in this case. If it's irrational, you just uh, divide the driver terms. Now over here, we have an e to the x in example b e to the x behaves differently to the left and to the right. So we may have to look for a left model and a right model. And when we say left and right model, we mean what's going on when x goes to negative infinity and what's going on when x goes to positive infinity. If we think about, say, subbing in infinity, which is not really what we should do, but we're just thinking about it. We, I wouldn't actually write this on my paper. e to the infinity minus infinity. It's hard to think about which one of those is bigger. Let's just take a big positive number. Let's say we're going to take e to the 100, and that would mean uh, we'd be minusing 100. Okay, So we're substituting in a big positive value. I wonder what those are. e to the 100. is oh, 2.68 times 10 to the 43. So you can see right away, this is huge, whereas this is merely kind of big. OK, so which one is driving the function to the far right? The one that produces the bigger value. And that could be bigger, positive, or negative. The e to the x part is more important on the right side. Now, if we were to do th the same thing with the left model, let's say I picked negative 100 as my approximation for negative infinity. That would be minus negative 100. OK, let's find out what e to the negative 100 is. It's tiny. And we already knew that. The limit as, e, as uh, x goes to negative infinity on e to the x is going to be 0. This is 0, and this is kind of big. So the thing that is driving the growth 
on the left side is this portion of the graph. You might say, well, what does that tell us? It tells us that the basic look of the graph on the right is exponential. On the left, the basic look of the graph is linear with a negative slope. Okay. And that gives us an idea of, without having to do a whole bunch of tables of value, what the graph looked like. Let's do the same thing with one last one. We have y equals x squared plus sine x. So here, I'm going to look at a left model and a right model. I'll get rid of this stuff just to make a little space. Left and right. Again, if I put in um, 100 for my right model, I'd have 100 squared plus sine of 100. OK, 100 squared, I know how big that is. That's 10,000. Sine of 100, let's find that out, is negative 0.5. So this one gives us 10,000. This one gives us negative 0.5-ish. Which one is more important? Clearly, the right model is y equals x squared. And you can also say, well, I know that sine is never going to be bigger than 1 or less than negative 1. So without having to sub anything in, you know sine's never going to give you a particularly large value. It's unlikely to be the driver. As we go to the left, well, I could put in negative 100 squared plus sine of negative 100. OK, I know this is 10,000. Let's find out what the sine of negative 100 is. Though it doesn't even matter what it is. We know it's between 0 and 1. It's not going to be particularly important. Plus 0.5. This is our driver, the thing that gave us the 10,000, which was y equals x squared. So to the far left and far right, that is going to look like a parabola on both sides. OK, moving on to 2.3, continuity. The curve is continuous on an interval if it can be drawn without lifting your pen. So if I have, say, a curve like this on an interval from A to B, that's continuous over that interval because I could draw it in one smooth motion. It's continuous at some point, C, if the actual value of the function at C is the same as the limit. Okay, so the limit and the actual point have to be the same for a curve to be continuous at a point. And let's uh, check out what that looks like. On this curve down here, we've got sort of a set of piecewise functions. We want to find out if it's continuous at x equals 1. Here's the informal definition. If I go along, I have to lift my pen to get to the next section. So it's not going to be continuous at x equals 1. But if we want to show that formally, we would look at this. The limb, as x goes to 1 of f of x, well, it's different from either side, so it does not exist. The right-hand and left-hand limits are different. But f at 1 does have a value. f at 1 is 1 in this case. That's where the closed dot is. So they're not the same. Let's try the same thing at 2. If I go along and draw, I definitely have to lift my pen here to get across that open dot and also to grab this dot. So no, this is not going to be continuous either. But let's show it formally. The limit as x goes to 2 on f of x, the limit the number we're approaching, the y value we're approaching, is 1. But the actual y value on the function is 2. f at 2, rather, is 2. They're not the same. OK, finally, we want to look at what's going on at x equals 3. If I go to draw there, I can do it in one smooth motion. Yes, it's going to be continuous there. But let's show it's formally. Lim as x goes to 3 of f of x is a y value of 2. And 
f of 3 is 2. They're the same. Hooray! That's what happens when we have continuity at a point. In terms of one-sided continuity, it's not fair to expect, say, this curve to be continuous from the left at 0 or from the right at 4. So we have one-sided continuity definitions. A function is considered continuous from the right if its limit from the right is the same as the function value there, and it's continuous from the left uh, if its limit from the left is the same as the function value. So this function down here, we want to find out if it's continuous at x equals 0. Well, let's check it out. It's only fair for us to look at the limit from the right at 0. And the limit is 1. And let's see, what is the actual function value at 0? Is 1. Yes, it is continuous at 0. Okay, At x equals 4, it's only fair for us to look for continuity from the left here. And coincidentally, this is the same y value, so the limit is 1. And let's check out f at 4. The actual y value at 4 is 1. So yes, this is continuous. So we don't put unreasonable expectations on the curve and tell it that it has to be continuous when it doesn't even exist to the left or right of some point. OK, so that brings us to the different types of discontinuities that could exist. Um, and the first type is the removable discontinuity. So we have x squared minus 3x plus 2 all over x minus 1. If I were to graph this, I might uh, do this. I might factor it. First of all, I know that it's going to be discontinuous. at x equals 1, and that is because I can't put in a 1 in this function. It's either going to be a point of discontinuity, or it's going to be a vertical asymptote, and it depends what happens as I factor the top. Okay, So right away, as we do this, we can divide these out, and this is true. It's x minus 2, uh, but it's got a point of discontinuity. when x is 1. And the y value that corresponds to that comes from subbing in 1 into this. So we get 1, negative 1. If we were to graph it, it would look like this. x minus 2, okay. point of discontinuity at 1, negative 1, looks like that. The graph is discontinuous at x equals 1, the point of discontinuity. The discont discontinuity can be removed by a function that fills in the hole. This is the definition of a removable discontinuity. You could fix this function and make it into, well, fix, air quotes, and make it into a continuous function just like this, just by filling in that removable discontinuity. The other discontinuities that we, we will look at won't have that property. Now, I want you to notice something. So there was a value that we couldn't put in for x, namely 1. But there, in this case, there's going to be a limit as x goes to 1. So if I have this whole thing over x minus 1, I can't sub in, but I can factor. I can divide out. This is going to be the lim as x goes to 1 of x minus 2. I can put in a 1 at this point, and I'll get negative 1. There is a limit there. So if I wanted to come up with the function that fills in that hole, I have two different ways that I can write it. Since I know the limit, here's one way I can write it. I can write it as a piecewise function. It can get its original definition of x squared minus 3x plus 2 
everywhere except where x is equal to 1, because you can't use that equation at x equals 1. And then I can just say, well, when x is supposed to be 1, I know that y should be negative 1. Okay, there's a piecewise function that fills in that discontinuity. The other option is if you could simply simplify the function, as in divide out all of its problems, then that could be the function with its discontinuity removed. So these are two different ways that you could write the extended function, the function where the discontinuity is removed. OK, let's check out the other three types of discontinuities we're talking about. So we can have infinite discontinuities. These, when you see this, you should be thinking vertical asymptote. If I were to sketch the graph of this curve over here, I would know it has a vertical asymptote right here. It has a horizontal asymptote right here. I know it has a y-intercept of a half. So it's basic look is like this. It's discontinuous because the function is approaching plus or minus infinity. Okay. And you could already recognize vertical asymptotes from rationals. They're factors of only the bottom. So this would have an infinite discontinuity at x equals negative 2. Again, you can see that that's the illegal number to put in there. Don't put in a y value. There's no y value to talk about here. OK, jump discontinuity. You'll often see these in some piecewise functions. But here's a cute little function that's not piecewise that has a jump in it. If I put in any positive number into this, I'll get 1. If I put in any negative number into this, I'll get negative 1. And I can't put in 0. I could already see that there's going to be a discontinuity at x equals 0. And once I produce the graph, I can see that it's what's called a jump. It jumps from one continuous section over here and just jumps up to the other section. You can't fix this function or make it continuous by just filling in one of those dots. So it's different from removable in that way. The last type of discontinuity we'll take a look at is the oscillating discontinuity. If I have this, sine 1 over x, uh, you can see that there's going to be a discontinuity at x equals 0. That is the only number you cannot put into that function. And here's what it's going to look like. It's going to have sort of loose oscillations that are going to get more and more tight and dense around the origin. And we have no idea what happens right at x equals 0. Same from the right-hand side. They're going to get more and more tight and dense, and we don't really know what's happening. If you want to see the computer generate this, here we go. We take a look. We zoom in. Now, I'm losing some of the top of the function. But well, you can see those oscillations just getting more and more dense. And eventually, the computer is just going to cry for mercy here. It looks just like a band of purple. Oscillations get tighter and tighter. OK, so let's try and do some of these discontinuity questions. Um, if I wanted to make this graph, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, but I know that this first portion over here, the 2 plus x, is for when x is less than negative 1. I know that it's a line with a slope of positive 1. So really all I'm interested in is what happens when x is negative 1. When x is negative 1, y is 1. And it's an open dot because it's not included. So there's the first piece of the function. Over the next little piece, I have a de definition of uh, x squared from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay. So that's a parabola. If I put negative 1 in this, 
I'm going to end up with 1, so the point negative 1, 1, and it's filled in because of this equals portion. If I put in positive 1, I'm going to get positive 1, and it's an open dot because this doesn't have an equals. Okay, finally, I have a portion of a hyperbola, or what I like to call a butterfly graph. So 1 over x minus 2, I know that that's a graph with a vertical asymptote at 2. I'll just put in the number 1 here. So 1 over 1 minus 2, that would give me a y value of negative 1. So it should contain the point 1, negative 1. Close dot, because it's included. And I know about this basic shape. And we know this stuff, from again, from the last course. So where do we have discontinuities? Well, let's see. Just informally, where do I have to lift my pen? I don't have to lift it here, because that's filled in. I do have to lift it at x equals 1. And what kind of discontinuity? Well, it jumps from up here to down here. There's a jump discontinuity. OK, at x equals 2, I definitely have to lift my pen, because it goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity. So to x equals 2, this is where we have an infinite discontinuity. And again, infinite discontinuity means the same thing as vertical asymptote. Let's get a little practice writing these extended functions. So if I want to eliminate the removable discontinuity in this one right here, the most sort of, um, I guess maybe not the most elegant, but the most full service way of approaching this is like this. That is a fine definition for that function everywhere except when x is equal to negative 1. All I have to know now is what the y value should be when x is negative 1 to remove the removable discontinuity. Okay. And to figure that out, here's what I need to figure out. Lim, as x goes to negative 1 in x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Obviously, we can't substitute in, because that would be division by 0. But we can factor. We can divide out. That'll give us the limb as x goes to negative 1 of x minus 1. And we can sub in now. So that'll be negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. The y value should be negative 2. And if you were to take a graphing package and take a look at this graph, you'd see that it should have a y value of negative 2 at an x of negative 1. It looks like it would, even though there's a hole there. The alternate way that you can approach something like this is by simply dividing out anything that can be divided out. Okay, There's the extended function, either written that way, y equals x minus 1, or this way. Clearly, the one on the right is more elegant. The one on the left is going to work in all cases, though. So you have your choice. I would go with the one on the right for the question like this. Here, we need to write a piecewise function to make this continuous at x equals 0. I can't divide out and make something that's nice and elegant. All I can say is that sine x over x is a beautiful definition for this function as long as x is not equal to 0. I can't sub in a 0 there. I'd have sine 0 over 0, and we can't divide by 0. So we just have to figure out what the value of the function, air quotes, should be at x equals 0. And to do that, we look at the limit, okay, just like we did above in red. Limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x, well, that's one of those definitions that we know. That should be 1. Boom. That renders the function continuous over uh, the set of real numbers. OK, moving on to the stuff in 2.4. 
we want to find the slope of the secant. So secant is a line through two points on a curve. Let's say that we had our favorite curve, y equals x squared. And I was looking at this point, 1, 1 on the curve, and this point up here, 3, 9. The secant would be the line that cuts through both of those points. And if we wanted to find the slope of the secant, it would be really easy. The slope of the secant is just rise over run from grade 10 math. Or we can call it change in y over change in x. Or we can call it y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. All of these things are equivalent. OK, so if I went with that definition, here's my x1, here's my y1, here's my x2, here's my y2. I have 9 minus 1 all over 3 minus 1. By the time I'm done, I have a slope of 4. And that corresponds to an average rate of change when we're dealing with word problems. Now, that's the kind of thing that we could do straight from grade 10. What we're looking at, uh, really, for the bulk of this course is finding the slope of a tangent, which is a line that touches the curve at a single point. So slope of the tangent. A tangent is a line that just touches a curve at a single point. In word problems, it corresponds to the instantaneous rate of change. So let's take a similar example here. y equals x squared. We have this. Somewhere up here, there's the point 3, 9. And the tangent looks like this. Now, sometimes people find it hard to figure out, well, exactly how steep should that be? Here's what you should do. You should imagine a marble going along the curve. And then imagine that the curve just disappears right at this point of x equals 3. The marble would keep going on its normal path, okay, the path that it was heading on before. And that gives us the tangent. Here's how we're going to find the slope of a tangent. Because you can't just use the same point twice in the slope formula. That would be division by 0. Mercifully, we've got a way of dealing with division by 0 in limits. So I'm going to imagine that I've got some point on a curve. I'm going to call it a. And the y value then would just be f at a. There's going to be another curve or another point, rather, just a little bit over. I'm going to call that horizontal distance between them h. And that point, therefore, would be a plus h, okay, a in a bit, and f at a plus h. So these two points we're looking at are a, f at a, and a plus h, f at a plus h. Our goal is going to make these, be to make these two points infinitely close together. So if I wanted just the slope between those two points, it would look like this. It would be uh, the, let's call this x1, y1, x2, y2. So y2, which is f at a plus h, minus y1, which is f at a all over x2, which is a plus h, minus x1, which is a. Okay, There's the slope between them, for sure. If I want the slope of the tangent, here's the only little tweak I need to make. I need to make those points infinitely close together, which means I want h to be as close to 0 as possible, or the limit as h goes to 0 which means, with a little bit of simplification on the bottom, the slope of the tangent is the limb as h goes to 0 of f at a plus h minus f of a all over h, because those a's um, add to 0. This here, this corresponds to the rise. The h is the infinitely small run. So let's put this to use. Suppose we want to find the slope of the tangent of this curve over here, x squared minus x at x equals 2. That's going to be our a value. 
If I were to sketch this curve, I'd know that it's a parabola with x-intercepts at 0 and 1. Looks something like this. Somewhere over here, there's going to be a tangent. I expect it to have a positive, somewhat steep slope. We're going to use this formula, which means I need to know two things. I need to know f at 2, which is pretty easy. 2 squared minus 2. Okay, f at 2 is just 2, coincidentally. The other thing I need to know is f at 2 plus h, which is going to be 2 plus h all squared minus 2 plus h. Okay, I square that, that gives me 4 plus 4h plus h squared minus 2 minus h, or 2 plus 3h plus h squared. Now we're ready to sub into the formula. For, so for us, we're looking for the slope of the tangent at x equals 2. That's going to be the limb as h goes to 0 of f at 2 plus h minus f at 2 all over h. Let's sub in. Lim as h goes to 0 of f at 2 plus h, that's 2 plus 3h plus h squared minus f at 2, that's 2 all over h. That gets us to 3h plus h squared all over h. And again, we can't substitute in here because that would be division by 0. But you can probably see what is about to happen. We can factor the top. That would give us 3 plus h, h by 3 plus h all over h. And here's where the magic happens. Divide out those h's because h is not 0 h is just infinitely close to 0. The slope of the tangent, therefore, is the limit as h goes to 0 of 3 plus h. Now we can sub in 0 for h. Okay, so that would be 3 plus 0. Or, by the time we're all done, the slope should be 3. Let's see if that makes any sense at all. If I look at my original sketch right up here, yeah, that looks like a slope of 3-ish. I mean, it's not to scale or anything, but it's a steep, positive slope. Okay, let's try the same on this one. f of root x at x equals 4. So let's just refresh our memories here. The formula is lim as h goes to 0 of f at a plus h minus f of a all over h. The two things I need to know are what is f at 4? So that would be root 4, or f of 4 is 2. And I also need to know what f of 4 plus h is, because 4 is our a value. So that's root 4 plus h. OK. Now we just sub in. Slope of the tangent is lim as h goes to 0 of root 4 plus h minus f of 4. That was 2. Okay. So this came from the red part over here. This came from the blue. Okay, just like this corresponds to the red part, and this corresponds to the blue. This is all over h. Uh, we've got radicals here. So our typical tack with radicals is to multiply by the conjugate. And see what happens. Hopefully we can get around this problem of division by 0. Okay, what's that going to give us? 4 plus h on top, plus 2 times root 4 plus h, minus 2 times root 4 plus h, those are gone, minus 4. Okay, all over h by 
root 4 plus h plus 2. Keep it coming. And we're going to have h over h by root 4 plus h plus 2. And again, we see that we can divide out our h's. So this may get us around our problem of division by 0. Okay, 1 over root 4 plus h plus 2. Are we allowed to substitute in 0 for h? You betcha. What's that going to give us? 1 over root 4 plus 0 plus 2. That's the slope of the tangent. Or 1 over 2 plus 2, or 1 over 4. Now, we didn't do a sketch to start off with here. Let's see if this is reasonable. Root x looks like this. Out here when x is 4 and y is 2, what's going on? We should have a positive, not very steep slope. Is that what we found? Absolutely. A slope of a quarter is not particularly steep, but it is positive. OK, last piece of the puzzle. Equations of tangents and normals. Uh, if we consider the graph of y equals x squared minus x, which is the same as y equals x by x minus 1. Okay. So it looks like this. We've actually looked at this graph in another problem as already. Um, we could easily draw the tangent where x equals 2. Okay, and we did in uh, an example just back here. Let's take a look. 15a, yeah, we drew it right up here. Now, we found the slope of that. We never actually found the equation of this tangent. Now, we want to go ahead and find the equation of that tangent, the line that just touches at x equals 2. And to find the equation of a line, we need to know two things. We know, need to know a point on the line, and we need to know the slope. And because names of formulas are so awesome in math, the formula that requires a point and a slope is called the point-slope formula. Okay. And there it is from grade 10 math, y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. Let's you find the equation of any line as long as you know those two things. So finding the point is easy. Sub your x into the function. So if we want the equation of the tangent to x squared minus x, where x is 2, we know we're talking about a point where x is 2. And let's see, what is the y value there? What is the function at 2? Would be 2 squared minus 2. Ah, coincidentally, we get a y value of 2. There's a point. Now, what is the slope of that tangent? Well, I won't go through it again, because we did find that slope of the tangent way back here. We found the slope of this function when x is 2, so that's exactly what we're talking about here, was a slope of 3. So let's just put that to use. Slope is 3. OK. So this is x1, y1. Now we can just use that point-slope formula. So the equation of that line is y minus y1 of 2 equals 3 x minus x1 of 2. Often we want these in x equals form, so or in y equals form, rather. So let's do that. OK, let's see if that actually looks like the tangent. I've generated the graph of both the original, which would be this red parabola, and what we allege is the tangent, the purple one, 3x minus 4. And let's take a look. They do look like they meet at 2, 2. The purple one does look like the tangent, and it really does have an equation of 3x minus 4. So we did a good job. We found the equation. Okay, so if it asks you for the equation of the line, make sure that you find an equation, not just the slope. 
Last thing we're going to touch on here. There's another type of line called the normal, and it's perpendicular to the tangent. So if we had the same sort of situation, if we had y equals x squared minus x, which we know now looks like this. If I were to graph the tangent at x equals 2, it looks like this. Uh, it's a little steep. looks something like that. If I were to graph this new line that we're calling the normal, it would be perpendicular to that blue one, perpendicular to the tangent. So this is the normal, and the blue one is the tangent. And it's no harder to find the normal. All you have to remember is that perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocals of each other. You can see that, that blue line has a positive slope. The red one's going to have a negative one. The blue one's going to be steep. The red one's not going to be very steep. So if we find the equation of the, t of the tangent, not the tangent, we want the normal to y equals x squared minus x, where x equals 2. Here's what we need. We need the point. And we know by now the point when x is 2, y is 2 on this curve. And we knew that the slope of the tangent was 3. That means the slope of the normal is just the negative flip, negative 1 third. OK, we follow it through using the point-slope formula. And here's what we get. Uh, y minus 2 equals negative one-third x minus two, or y minus two equals negative one-third x plus two-thirds, or y equals negative one-third x plus eight-thirds. And if I went and graphed that along with the original, then they would really indeed look like the normal. And you can see up here, that red one kind of looks like what we're saying here. It's a negative slope, not very steep and it's got a y-intercept uh, that's a little above 2. In terms of word problems, make sure that you get this straight. Average rate of change should be the slope of the secant. Instantaneous. rate of change is the slope of the tangent. If you're looking for some practice on this material, uh, there's a link to the chapter 2 review in the video description below. There's also a link to the work solutions of the review and a video of the work solutions. Don't say I never did anything for you. I hope you found this helpful and I'll see you later.